So Thomas Bomber Kavna cooked up this gun plot behind bars. And, you know, amazingly, like a lot of people that, that are in prison, they take advice from other criminals who are also behind bars. Like, you know, would they be really who you should be taking advice from? You're all locked up, banged up abroad, whatever. Oh, I don't know. I mean, this caused actually a lot of confusion, actually, for our subs and Did all it? of our team. Because, Why? Well, like mostly because we're talking about Stephen Gerrard, the, the Liverpool legend's uh, cousin. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Gerard, Called Uncle he, Bobby. Who he calls Uncle Bobby. Yeah. Even though he's his cousin. Yes. So that caused a, a rake of confusion. It's very Irish people. though, isn't it? Yeah, because we got sub-editors that go through the copy and say, like, yeah. you know, they check these yeah, little yeah, things yeah. and they go, back, well, why is he called him, why is he called his uncle if it's his cousin? Right. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so Uncle, uncle Bobby uh, Gerard, uh, Stephen Gerard is obviously one of the greatest players that has ever come out of of, of England, uh, one of the greatest Liverpool players of all time, like a, a fantastic footballer. I mean, you can't underestimate how, how brilliant he was. Um, but he has come from a rough part of, of Liverpool and he's always had these associations, uh, innocent associations, because Stephen Gerrard's obviously not involved in crime, but family associations with with criminal figures in 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 liver in Liverpool, um, one of them is his cousin, who he calls Uncle Bobby, um, mm -hmm. um, and Uncle Bobby Gerard um, was convicted in two thousand and sixteen in connection with a major uh, cocaine trafficking plot. I think the value given on it was something like sixty million uh, pounds sterling. Um, Bobby Gerard was one of a number of, of English guys who were operating out of this cafe in the Netherlands. Um, it was actually one of these really, really famous cases in the UK, mm. partly because the Dutch police filmed these people going in and out of this cafe over a number of months. Do we have any of that footage? There is some CCTV. I don't know if, it, if, if it's still there, um, but it was you know, a cafe. It wasn't normal. People weren't going in and out of there. It was hot. There was a lot of security. There was a buzzer at the door. And they were basically over there arranging cocaine deals. Um, what they were doing was they were bringing cocaine um, in from, actually from Argentina in, in meat. Again, you see, the reason they, they do brought it in through the meat was because it gets rushed through the customs. Yeah. Because, it, you know, it's going to... Like bananas or any of these foods yeah. that will perish if they aren't, you know, they can't stay in a queue, sure they can't. Exactly. So, and if they're big enough company, they'll sort of get this trusted sort of trader uh, recognition and they get brought through. Basically, they were busted. He went on the run and stayed on the run for a number of years. And in 2016, Bobby Gerard contacted the police to say he was back in the UK and he'd had enough. And He, he was convicted, of course, in 2013 in yeah. the UK and went on the run. Yeah. So over three years, he sort of remained on the run and he showed up on the UK's most wanted list. He did. And along with another guy, a uh, guy, Michael Mugan, who was ultimately tracked down in Dubai and extradited home. Yeah. Um, but he'd had enough, uh, I think he's in his mid-50s and he, he probably thought that he can't just keep doing this. Like a lot of these guys, you know, the money runs out at some point and, you know, he's getting old and he just decided in 2016 to come in and basically hand himself in. Because of the pressure of being on the lamb, as they call it. Yeah. And I, like, it, it, I, I suppose, and, you know, spoken to people before about it. They can't see their families. They can't communicate with them, contact them. They're sort of living constantly, looking over their shoulder. It's okay if you're not up there on a poster yeah. of the most wanted. Um, did the UK offer rewards at that time? I can't recall, but, you know, that was a big thing back then, the most wanted. Um, I'm sure it's all over social media now, yeah. the most wanted. The FBI most wanted was a huge thing as well there in the early 2010s. But, uh yeah, so he eventually handed himself in, went into prison in Dovegate. In Dovegate. Which is where Bomber Kavanagh lands in, in around 2019. Yeah. After he's first arrested and held on charges around a stun gun and later hit with these charges, these big drug charges. That's yeah. what worries him more than anything. That, and, you know, the, the Kavanagh organised crime gang, the Burn organised crime gang, like their, their sources of, of strength really in the UK were in the sort of Birmingham area, but also in, in Merseyside. I mean, they had a huge presence there. Um, 
people have spoken about it before. They were kind of the primary suppliers and really were pulling the strings in there. So when somebody like Bomber Kavanaugh goes into prison, he's going to automatically be sort of taken in under the wing of other major criminal mm. figures like like Bobby Gerard, and during the time, and of course, I mean his his nephew yeah. Lee Byrne is in a relationship. Was he in 2019? I don't think so. But look, certainly at that point... He goes on to be in a relationship with Lily Gerard. So they have met at some point over the course of these events with Bomber Kavanagh. Yeah. Um, and also, look, I mean, there, there, there's no doubt that that the Burns were spending a lot of time in Liverpool and getting to know all sorts of people. Um, so while they're in prison, they're talking about, like, as we always hear, that's all they talk about in their prison, their appeals, hmm. you know, they're sentencing what's how they can, you know, get the best out of the whole system. And it is believed at that point that they hatched they hatched up a plan to produce these weapons really in order to get Bomber Kavanagh cut his sentence really from, you know, what he was facing. He ultimately got 20, 22 years, was it? But I suppose he would have been hoping for something like 10 to 14 years and to walk out, still a relatively young man, and um, maybe with some of his assets intact. So Bobby Gerard tells him a story about a guy called John Haas. Now, John Haas, um, like this is one of the massive scandals of UK criminal history. Mm -hmm. um, now, we don't probably remember it. It didn't happen in, in, in our country. But what happened with John Haas and John Haas was, um, was he was an associate actually of, of Curtis uh, Warren, but I think they'd fallen out actually and by the time he was convicted and he was sentenced in the 90s to an 18-year prison sentence for a major heroin shipment. While he was in, uh, while he was facing this sentencing, he had spoken to the police and he told them he knew where all, I think it was, he was talking about hundreds of weapons, high-powered weapons were and that he could tell the police, he could give the police this information. Um, which he subsequently did. And 150 guns in total he was going to hand up. While he, while he was being sentenced, um, the judge was informed of this basically by the police and he was given something which is a royal pardon, which we don't have in Ireland. But effectively, um, he served just 11 months of his 18-year sentence. But, I mean, it was the Home Secretary at the time, Michael Howard, I think, signed off on this deal, um, which was really... Yeah, I, I mean, mean, as time went on and it emerged that these guns had been well, based I mean, yeah. in, and they it had been a plot. Basically, they were they had um, presented it as if they knew where these guns were. They were being used by others and they were just giving the locations. But it kind of emerged over the next 10 years that actually are, are thereabouts that actually they had... Well, they they'd hidden set the weddings them themselves, yeah. set them up, and that they had made a sort of fool of the system, yeah. And the uh, the Home Secretary, and they were basically wound up with sentences in two thousand and eight. They were convicted of perverting the course of justice. I mean, it was a huge big deal, and um, because there was all sorts of allegations. I mean, even just last year, somebody wrote a book about it again, uh, a retired policeman, like. They walked out and I don't think it had really been noticed at the time, but eventually it all started to come to light. Um, that bit of it, obviously Uncle Bobby yeah. didn't sort of... Uh, Factor in. Well, did he tell Bomber Kavan about that bit of the plan, the undoing of it? Or did he say to him, look, you know, they were found out, but you just need to be careful that you, were, you aren't found out and then you'll be grand, you'll be home and dry. One way or another, Bomber Kavanagh took Uncle Bobby's advice and he went ahead to plot to buy and hide his own weapons in Yuri so he could hand them over to the authorities and get a reduced, get a reduced sentence. sentence. And of course, it, it it's like uh, the end of Scooby-Doo, you know, it could have all worked mm. except for the anchor trap hack mm. because without the it's anchor... a cunning plan, all right. It was, it was a cunning plan that all went wrong. Um, but except for the anchor chat hack, he might have got away with it because he would have been able to produce these you know, this this stockpile of weapons in the UK's territory. You know, he went across the border and buried it just across the border. Um, 
and he might have got a reduced sentence. Um, he w- look, when we look back on the on the case, you see he was willing to invest a couple of hundred thousand uh, pounds worth of, of money, basically to to hatch this plot. Um, but again, it all went Pete Tong. Mm. Now, Stephen Gerrard has previously been linked, as we said, to Liam Byrne. In in the years that that followed, his daughter and Liam Byrne's son became an item. Lily Gerard is an influencer. Yeah. And Lee Byrne is... An influencer, I suppose. Is he an influencer? Yeah, yeah. okay. You know. Um, and they have a very high-end lifestyle themselves. But Gerard himself was caught on camera with Liam Byrne, which was yeah, newsworthy, I mean, but didn't do anything to damage. What does he do now? He is a manager in Saudi Arabia. Oh. So he's probably being paid and such an eye-watering amount of money that you cannot believe it. Right. Um, so... Look, he, Stephen Gerrard has, doesn't seem to fear that association at yeah. all. Um, there was a video where um, Liam Byrne is present and he phones up Stephen Gerrard and Stephen Gerrard gives a, a message to a friend of Liam Byrne's. People may have seen it um, when Stephen Gerrard was over in Ireland a couple of years ago. Um, there was pictures on social media. It wasn't as if he was snapped by a mm. paparazzi. Um, there was pictures of him being ferried around by James Jaws Byrne and also by Nathan Biggie Little, uh, an associate of 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 Liam Burns and, and Lee Byrne. So he hasn't sort of attempted to hide it at all. Um, to us, it looks a touch bizarre because obviously uh, Liam Byrne is not just a, an Irish criminal. Um, he's somebody that has come before the courts in the in the UK in a very serious way. Well, he's been named also as one of the senior lieutenants in the Kinnahan cartel. Yes, he has. Um, so it's an unusual association. Mm. Obviously, uh, sports stars don't seem to mind a lot. A lot of the time, that they're mixing with, they just sort of ignore it. They're sometimes they're childhood. Look, like I mean, Conor McGregor has been photographed over the years with many members. Are one in particular, the late David Byrne? He was pictured with a number of times. You know, they were kind of yeah, knew I one mean, another but, growing up and stuff and. And Stephen Gerrard, as people will know, knew a lot of people growing up that would have gone on to become some of the most senior figures in in organised crime in, in Liverpool. So he's well used to it then? He is well used to it. I mean, his him, both himself and his wife, Alex Gerrard, would have known these people and that's been spoken about many times in the UK paper. Obviously, that doesn't, people can know people and that has no implication of, of them being involved in any criminality. Um, and nor have Lily Gerrard or, or Lee Byrne any association with criminality. But look, he doesn't seem to shy away from it and it's certainly a, an unusual thing. Mm. We heard in the trial, um, and you were there for this evidence, uh, Liam Byrne in in those anchor chat messages where they all use these handles and even though they obviously clearly believe that they're safe and encrypted, he refers to somebody called the Scouser and that Scouser is believed to be Bobby Gerrard. Well, Uncle Bobby's advice mightn't have been the best. No. And I wonder, you know, again, will the... Well, do you want to hear what happened to John Haas? Because we always... What happened to him? We always yeah. speculate what happens to these guys when well, they're all done. you tell me he's retiring somewhere beautiful? No, I'm not. Oh. Um, he was... Ultimately, I think he got a 21-year sentence for this conspiracy. Probably got a particularly hard sentence because of the high-profile nature of it. Mm. Um, he was released on licence, um, I think it was two years ago, but he was brought back back into prison uh, just last year, and he's now likely to be in prison to twenty thirty, because at the age of seventy four, he um, he was convicted of uh, um, setting fire to a Range Rover after being hired to collect the drugs debt. Um, so he <laughs> he was out after all that time, yeah. And he's now back into back 20, in. 20. And like he was going, he was being hired as an enforcer at the age of 74, which is, I suppose. Well, know. that's extraordinary in it itself, is extraordinary. isn't it? I mean, so, there's no ageism when it comes to the criminal underworld, is there? No, there isn't. So that's... No. that's, that's Your reputation <laughs> just goes before you end off. I don't know if that's a, a positive thing, but... I wonder, um, like, you know, an enforcer nowadays, do you really need to be physically fit? I don't know. Probably not. But no. uh, either way, um, it didn't. It didn't work for him, and mm. he's back in back in prison to twenty thirty. Well, maybe he can give advice to Bomber the next time round. Maybe so. Thanks, Niall. Thanks, Nicola. 
I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.